I just want to do God's will. The kind of revolution that the world needs is a Christian revolution. If you want a miracle, you've got to expect it to happen. You are the recipients of God's grace and God's blessings, and you rejoice in that reality. Welcome to Life Today Live. Randy Robinson here, and we're going to talk about something that is very important. Uh, and, and wherever you're at in life, if uh, you know you're married, then this is this is for you. If you ever want to be married, then uh, this is some good things to know before you get into that kind of relationship. Let's face it. Uh, in God's plan, uh, marriage is a foundational pillar of society, of a strong society. A good marriage relationship uh, can enable a good family. A solid family enables a good community, and good communities build good nations. So we're getting right down to the core and the foundation of it today. And there is a devotional out that would be a great idea for uh, any couple or anyone, even in a relationship that may lead to marriage uh, that is available to you. It is called Keep Your Love On. It's written by Danny Silk, who is the president and co-founder of Loving On Purpose. And he's out there in California doing the good work uh, affiliated with uh, Bethel and Jesus Culture, which um, have really, we've had a lot of people on the program over the last few years. Um, Been a real blessing, not just in the music that everybody knows, but in the ministry. So, uh, Danny, great to have you here on Life Today Live. Oh, thanks, Randy. It's great to be here. Walk us through a little bit of kind of how this all came about. What put you in this role and uh, the original book that led to the devotional and, and what you're trying to communicate in this? Uh, yeah, I, you know, you uh, you get married and, and you think it's just going to go one way and you and, uh, it's always surprising. It's just always surprising <laughs> yeah. that uh, you know all all your all your deepest darkest stuff comes to the surface, and so does hers. And you spend a lot of time working that out. I would say much of our ministry to families, you know, we've written books about uh, for parents. We've written books for leaders. We've written books for uh, just relationships, but but primarily for marriage and couples and um it, it really just comes out of hard fought lessons learned in life hmm. i have a, a theory and <laughs> i said it to my wife one time probably not in the, in the right way I, I probably didn't set it up correctly but um i view marriage not as I mean, yes, we want to keep our love on, if you will. We want to feel good about our relationship. We, you know, all the the benefits of, you know, that are emotional are, are important. I, I wouldn't downplay them. But I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that marriage is fundamentally a commitment. And I think we hear it in our, our vows for better or for worse, you know. Um, and sometimes it doesn't feel good. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes uh, it requires us... Uh, humbling ourselves, you know, not not a fun thing to do. I, am, am I looking in the right direction as far as the commitment being the, the foundation of it? Absolutely. I mean, it's a covenant relationship, right? So yeah. any covenant is going to require sacrifice, mm-hmm. and uh, hardly anybody's throwing a party over being a sacrifice, <laughs> you know. So it's it is a uh, it, it 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 requires more than you have. And that's why you've got to have the Spirit of God activated in your life and in your heart. You know, you you have to have an eternal source of of, of not only love but grace and forgiveness. Because I, people injure each other, scare each other, uh, create situations where we feel powerless. So we change our goal from being connected to this person to protecting ourselves from this person. And that's where this, you know, often comes into play is, you know, couples come into my office and um, I will ask them, what's the goal of your marriage? And they say, well, you know, we'll make sure that our kids don't go to prison. We want to make sure that we make enough money. We're not miserable old people. And we want to, you know, do something for Jesus. And I'm like, wow, okay, well, those are, that's your financial goals, your ministry goals, and your parenting goals. What's the goal of your marriage? Hmm. 
and it's silence because they haven't really considered the work they're going to put into this lifelong commitment and the quality of it on the outcome. And so I explained to them right there, the goal of your relationship currently is a safe distance. How much distance do we need to protect ourselves from being further injured Mm. by each other? Mm. So, and then I tell them, if that's the goal, you don't need my help. You're doing a great job without me. But if you want to change your goal to connection, then I can help you with that. And there starts the journey. We now have to figure out, we want, we have the goal of connection, not sure how to do it because we've practiced so much self-preservation. Oh, that's uh, I think you stepped on a few toes there. Uh, I know I've been guilty of that over my 32 years of, of marriage almost. Um, that's not a, that's not a healthy thing. What, what, are, what happens when we do that? I mean, we, I mean we, most of us don't do it on purpose, in fairness, right? Yeah, it's just a bad habit. What, what happens is we settle into the distance, and then we blame the other person for the distance. <laughs> and then because my goal with you is distance, you've actually been set up by me to not be able to do anything right. Because every time you advance towards me, every time you do something sweet, every time you try to connect, because my goal's distance, I villainize your attempts to get my distance back. Mm. So you are always in, in the accusation seat of me because my goal keeps you at a distance. Mm. So you can't do anything right. Does, does this oftentimes come from... Uh you know, our childhood, our, our own parents, because, you know, especially today, there's so many divorces, you know, so many just bad relationships. Um, do we pick a lot of these things up from our parents, do you think? Sure. I mean, we all have uh, programming. We all have training. We all have uh, life experiences. Uh, nonetheless, though, right, the number one command we have from Jesus is to love. You know, we, we're, we're commanded to get good at this. So we really don't have any excuses. Uh, the world is raining with excuses. People have excuses for not going to work. You know, people have excuses for not learning to read. People have so many excuses in our society that Christians have absorbed excuses to not learn. Number one, number one command, love each other, you know. Like, oh, gosh. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's the the patterns of this world have literally set us up to defy the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, And what's amazing (laughs) is that when we understand the, the kingdom way of doing things, which applies very directly in marriage, is that there's the benefits we can't even comprehend um when you see people decide to change the goals of their relationship uh into something that really is more godly if we're honest um what what do you see on the other side of that hard work well you know for starters just the quality of your life goes much higher it's it's such a struggle it's such a drain to be in a disconnected intimate relationship Mm. you know because when you know we're wired we're we're programmed to have intimacy like uh our relationship with god is a an intimate union i mean he wants to know us deep and saturate our heart and for us to trust him and to follow him and to look like him and then when you get married you know it's the same kind of thing where you're you're supposed to saturate your life and your life goes from what you can do by yourself to this multiplication effect of you put two sets of strengths together and you should multiply your life, not just, you know, double your life. Uh, the, the quality of experience that you have satisfies this need for intimacy. And when we, when we can't do that, 
then we start looking outside our relationship to get that euphoric trigger. Mm. And so this is where addictive cycles come from. Mm. Addictions come from brokenness in our, our healthy place of getting that euphoric experience. Now we're going to start looking for porn and external sexual relationships, and we're going to... Uh, dive into carbohydrates and sugar and alcohol and cocaine or whatever else to get that euphoria that we think we're in control of. And so addiction really is my attempt to uh, get the fruit of intimacy through something I control because I don't control my marriage and I don't control my relationship with God. So maybe I can control my relationship with porn. Yeah, uh, bad substitute. Uh, you, the term intimacy. Now, the world has stripped down intimacy to just be sexual, primarily. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, you, you relate it in a marriage, and also with God, which is obviously a different thing. What do you mean by intimacy? What is God's definition of intimacy? Yeah, intimacy is that um, walking in the light. You know, into me you see <laughs> is uh, because I show you. You know, I show you me into you, I see, because you showed me. And so it's people standing in the light together. Like I would have an intimate relationship with my with my son, with my daughter, with my brother, with you know my my closest friends. I'm going to have intimacy because we've decided to exchange truth in our relationship so that there can be trust. Mm. Well, that's good. I think when we keep that in mind, it, it does. It changes everything. Uh, let's get into your seven pillars. I, you touched on a couple of them, uh, but in in your book, you lay out these seven pillars of a healthy relationship. Um, walk us through some of those so we can understand maybe what our our goal will be, or when we adjust our goal, maybe some of the the fruit will be. Um, yeah, the pillars really are the idea of you know the foundation of my life is you know, unconditional acceptance that that has to be established in the relationship with someone. There has to be this idea that you get to be you in our relationship. I get to be me in our relationship, but I don't get to uh, hang on to my character flaws that jack the anxiety up. (laughs) So that gets confronted at the same time. You still get to be you. I get to be me. And this is that walking in the light thing. It's like, all right, uh, when you lie to me, it really hurts. Mm. And, and it really disconnects us. So you keep lying, we're going to stay disconnected. You want to tell me the truth. And that's, you know, that's going to be part of this whole thing is truth, love, self-control, responsibility, faith, vision, honor. You know, these, these pillars are going to hold up the roof, which is peace, love, and joy. Mm. People want peace, love, and joy, but they're held up by something. Mm. Otherwise, they're just there's just no opportunity for them to, to take place in our lives. So back to the addictive cycles. You know, you're trying to get something in your life that's a counterfeit mm-hmm. because you you, you weren't committed to love and love is is much more about the experience of safety the experience of connection uh, the experience of value when you when you say you know we fight all the time and we're you know we're constantly at each other's throat but we love each other i say you know you might want to pick a new word besides love because that would not be love uh you know Truth, the the pillar of truth is the exchange of, uh, you know, the the pillar of trust is the exchange of truth back and forth. So truth isn't what I think about you. Truth, it's what's going on in me in this relationship. Mm -hmm. So I feel connected. I feel hurt. I feel scared. Mm -hmm. I feel powerless. I feel safe. I feel loved, you know. What is the experience I have going on inside of me? That's truth. How do how well do we exchange that back and forth? 
because most people spend most of their time telling other people about other people instead of telling other people about themselves. Mm. And that's the practice of intimacy and building trust, self-control, responsibility. It just goes on and on. All right. Well, I have a hard question for you coming up, but I want to show people a couple of things real quick. This is the website. Uh, if you want to follow up on this, you're like, okay, maybe uh, this guy's saying some things that I need to hear more about. You can go to lovingonpurpose.com uh, and uh, get the book, but uh, check out other resources for relationships. Uh, and then this is the original book, and I realized that I've got, I got the devotional. Uh, so this is Keep Your Love On by Danny Silk, and then I have in my hands the devotional, which is a 365-day thing for couples. So both good resources, however you want to work through it. The goal is to strengthen your relationship uh, and maybe tear down some of the negative things and build up some good things. And it's never too late to do that, honestly. I don't care how old you are, how long you've been married. It can always get better. I have a tough question for you because um, I've seen a lot of books. You know, books go in cycles. Uh, and a lot of themes come up. And one that I've seen, um, I know Lisa Turkhurst wrote about it, and, you know, her, her marriage, uh, just, boy, it, it's just a travesty. Uh, and so I get it. But it's this idea of boundaries. Uh, and you address this. Um, it seems like boundaries uh, can pre- basically prevent intimacy, really, but are they necessary? What? How, how should we view that? Because let's face it, some people if they are open and transparent and you know the truth is met with abuse or or manipulation all sorts of negative things i mean it kind of takes two to dance to have a good relationship does it not yeah absolutely um you know as long as my goal is connection with people then boundaries boundaries create the hope of reconciliation so you know there's be an injury there'll be a, a threat there'll be some some reason that there's a disconnect and the boundary really is there to repair the relationship to its its original status but some people aren't willing to bring the respect and responsibility that's required to repair that relationship so they end up with a different access to me than they had previous Mm. uh the you know, the, the story in the Bible about the uh, prodigal son, you know, he comes and he says, hey, I wish you were dead so I could have my money. And this and the dad gives it to him, which is really sets a boundary. The kid leaves. Now he doesn't have a destructive, disrespectful kid in his house because the kid has taken his 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 inheritance and went somewhere. Mm-hmm. The kid, the dad has a a a house he wants to live in and the kid has what he wants then the kid's out of money and the kid now return he remembers he's the son he returns okay now there's going to be a new set of boundaries and that is this kid is humble and this kid is has actually going to punish himself the dad has to remind him that he's his son restore him as his son i mean these there's illustrations throughout the bible of god setting boundaries and offering reconciliation. Most people have the goal of distance when they set a boundary, and that's called rejection. It's not called a boundary. People use that word, it's rejection. You're out of my life, man. You're out of this space. I'm bitter with you, you don't get to come back. So mature love casts out fear, but immature love casts out people. Wow. Wow, I you know I, I've never heard it put that way, and I, and I I think that's really true and good. To, uh, if we're going to establish boundaries, reconciliation needs to be the goal. Is what I hear you saying, uh, and not just distance and rejection. It's yeah, it's offered. It may not be attainable just because the other person. Uh, just wants to blame, just wants to accuse, you know, whatever, whatever. Like, okay, well, it's not, I don't control your half. I just control my my half. Yeah. Yeah. And my half is my goal is connection with you. My goal is love, respect, responsibility. I'll listen and adjust and require the same from you. 
Yeah, and that's important. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. And, you know, the, the the prodigal may have never come home, and that relationship would have never been repaired. I mean, I get it. It's a it's a parable, but it's it happens all the time, and it's going on right now. What do you say to someone who's in a bad relationship, uh, and they want to improve things? They're like, yeah, I'd do all the things he said, but but they can't get their spouse to uh, you know to, to play along. Yeah, well, you, it, it's good to get a third party involved at some level, just because you know what you don't realize is is your own stuff. You know, like you mm-hmm. like you can't smell your own breath. So it's it's pretty tough to um, know what you're contributing to the problem, and by the time people get to a counselor they're pretty jacked up with hurt and anxiety Mm. so it it a third party can help you listen to each other can help make some adjustments and then help point out what needs to happen but if your goal is distance (laughs) a counselor is not going to help you either that's true you know so that it's it's always it always starts there for me is if you if you want to change your goal to connection then let's walk through this. But if you want to keep the goal of distance, you're doing a great job. You don't need my help. <laughs> I, want, I want to hit one more point that you uh, you talk about because uh, I've kind of lived this out. Uh, and I think if I had understood maybe what you're talking about, I could have been better at it in the past. And that's this idea of, of passive and assertive communication. Um, and I think some of the passiveness in, in my past has been, frankly, laziness in the relationship, uh, you know. And, and it just, it, it's done not di- like direct damage, but sort of just sideways damage, right? Does that make sense? Um, ex- explain to us what you're talking about and how we can understand the difference, how to do it right, how to, you know, maybe quit doing it wrong, Uh because this is this is i mean communication is obviously key to any relationship yeah i mean if we're going to mature love we have to kind of declare war on fear and so uh passive passive aggressive and aggressive communication styles they all jack up the anxiety in the relationship Uh, you know passive says oh you matter i don't passive aggressive says oh you matter not and <laughs> aggressive says, I matter, you don't. You know, mm-hmm. So all three of those are ways of trying to control the other person. And assertive, assertive communication says, you matter, and so do I. Mm-hmm. And so now it's actually powerful people trying to work out their needs instead of somebody trying to manipulate somebody else. So the communication styles are super important when it comes to communicating in a way that lowers anxiety so that the message we care about each other can actually be experienced. Do you think some people confuse aggressive communication with assertive communication? Uh, I think that people commonly think that anybody that values themselves doesn't value other people. Hmm. And and so that's why assertive is is so good at listening and eliciting Mm. listening Mm. so you know a good assertive communicator when they value the the needs of another person so being you know being confident and direct isn't necessarily assertive Mm. it can be very you know aggressive yeah but if i am eliciting a a win-win with the with the conversation much more likely to be assertive yeah oh that's 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 good. I mean, geez, have you, what, what has your relation, has your marriage always been fabulous? Oh, you know, for, uh, well, I, I, the, uh, in a, 12 years in, the guy that did our premarital counseling, Bill Johnson, you know, he says to us, because Sherry and I were bickering about something, he goes, this reminds me of the, that note on your assessment. I said, what note? He goes, remember the Taylor Johnson compatibility assessment? I said, yeah. He goes, remember the note that was on it? I said, no. <laughs> and he goes, I didn't tell you about this note. No. He says, oh, for 10 years, I send this assessment off for all these premarital couples. I got yours back. I opened the envelope and there was a post-it note. First time in 10 years. It said, Bill, 
do whatever you can to stop this marriage. I said, no, you didn't tell us about that, no. And so my wife and I are clinically incompatible. <laughs> and, and, and between her two parents and her stepfather that raised her and my two parents, between those five people, they represent 15 marriages. Every one of them has been married three times. Oh, wow. So the tidal wave of destruction that is crashing in on mine and Sherry's marriage is uh, paralyzing with anxiety and brokenness. Mm. And this June will be 39 years that we've been married. So what do you primarily attribute that to, the success, breaking the cycle? Uh, well, that commitment that you were talking about in the beginning. Yeah. And then being surrounded with like-minded people who have the same value. So that's who you go to for help. You don't go to your family who says, oh, just change them like your socks. Yeah. You know, you go, you, you go to the people that actually have a devotion to covenant and are doing it with each other and doing it in their own homes. And, and then you just grow. You grow like a redwood, man. You <laughs> just better figure this out because nobody else is going to make you have a great marriage. Yeah, here in Texas, we grow like a live oak, I guess would be the, <laughs> the <laughs> on Redding, it's a, it's a red, it's good. Man, I'll tell you what I hear, Danny, honestly, and that's what a lot of people need to hear today in their marriage is hope. Because yeah. some of the experts, right? So you've got, you know, I know some people don't like those personality tests and things like that. Uh, but I mean, some of the experts would tell you, no, that's not gonna work. But I, I what I hear you saying is that God's way does work. Absolutely. And I always say, you know, I know you're discouraged. I know you're hopeless. That's all right. I brought the hope with me. <laughs> you know, I brought the hope with me. I've been through it, man. We have been through it. We had to figure this stuff out. And once you got two people willing to take responsibility for themselves and they quit blaming each other, you are on the road to success. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's where we all want to be if we're honest. Um, but it does take work and it does take uh, a sacrificial oftentimes love and humility to get there. And as much as we tend to not like that, if you look at the life of Christ, I mean, that, that is the way forward. Uh, and so there is hope for you. I want to ask you real quick about the Kylo podcast for people that are like, you know, I need to, I need to hear more of this. I need to hear it. I need to hear this tomorrow as well. <laughs> Reminder, right? <laughs> tell, tell us about that real quick. The Kylo show podcast. Kylo stands for keep your love on, not kill your loved ones. <laughs> um, so it, it, uh, it is, uh, it's me and my daughter. We are just having a great time. We're about a hundred podcasts in. So it's new to us in, in, in a lot of ways, but at the same time, it's every week it comes out and we talk like this about everything and, uh, people are loving it. People are just loving it. The Kylo show. Podcast. Yeah. yeah, so check that out. It'll encourage you. K Y L O show. You can wherever you get your podcast, go look for that. Uh, and of course, the book "Keep Your Love On" in the companion devotional available right now. Wherever you get books, Danny, man, I appreciate I appreciate the insight, the wisdom, uh, and most of all, the encouragement and the hope. Because God, you know, God didn't make a mistake when He put a man and a woman on this earth and said, you know. This is, this is for you. You know, you're for you're made for each other. Uh, so yeah. I think we, we should always have that hope. We always have that hope in Christ. So anything you want to add? I appreciate you being here. Uh, I just appreciate the opportunity, Randy. Uh, great to meet you. Great to have you guys out there watching, listening. I hope this has blessed you. If you know someone that could use a little encouragement, hit that share button. And if you haven't hit like, follow, or subscribe, I invite you to do that now. And come back. We've got more good insight from people like Danny, some encouragement, some hope, letting you know that, man, no matter what you're going through, our God is greater. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live.